Well, good morning. morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, as we have already proclaimed, Father, we are amazed at your love for us. How marvelous it is, how wonderful and awesome and amazing and special and significant and great and unending is the Savior's love for us. Lord, we may not have experienced much love over the past week or the past days or even the past hours, but Lord, we are reminded of yours. And we thank you for it. We ask your blessing now, in Jesus' name, amen. Has anybody ever asked you the same question multiple times? <laughs> Has anybody ever asked you the same question multiple times? <laughs> Has anybody ever asked you the same question multiple times? How many of you, somebody's asked you the same question multiple times? Should be everybody, because I just did it to you. Have, you. have you ever done that? Have you ever asked someone the same question multiple times? How many of you have ever asked your children the same question multiple times? Of course. If you're a parent, you've done this. Maybe it went something like this. Why did you do that? And then they gave you a response, not an answer. There's a difference between a response and an answer, amen? They gave you a response, not an answer, and so you said, tell me, why did you do that? And then they said, I don't know. <laughs> and you said, I don't know is not an answer. Again, you received a response, not an answer. And so you asked a third time. No, I want you to tell me, why did you do that? And maybe you asked a fourth time or a fifth time or a sixth time, but you asked the same question over and over again. I bet we can all relate to that. I bet we've all been on both sides of that scenario as well at some point in our lives. Either our parents did it to us or maybe we had an employer, a boss, a supervisor do it to us. Maybe our spouse has done it to us. Now, there are several reasons why we ask people the same question multiple times. Have you ever, have you ever put your thinker on that? Like, why do we do this? I, I really spent some time praying and thinking about that this week. Why do we do that? Why do we, why do we ask people the same question over and over and over and over again? I think there are a couple of main reasons why. I, I thought on this for a, a, a bit this week, and, um, and here, here's the things. These are the first couple blanks in your bulletin. I, I think we do this, um, and these aren't in any particular order, but I, I think we do this sometimes just for clarification. We want to make sure that they understand the question, and we want to make sure that we understand the response. Or maybe we... we we're, we're doing it to clarify something they said in the response, but there's a, a clarifying element to asking the same question over and over and over again. The, the second reason I think we do this is for uh, what we might just call consideration. We, we, we ask the same question a second time or a third time or a fourth time because we want whoever we're asking the question to to reflect on it a little bit deeper. <laughs> We want them to consider that question a second time. We want them to consider their response to that question a little bit harder on the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time. Maybe we just want them to consider their answer again. But there's some kind of consideration involved. I, I think a third reason we do this is for um, what we might call confirmation. We're looking to see, does their story change? Anybody ever ask that question again just to see if that story didn't change just a little bit, especially with your little kids? Because that story will change. <laughs> we we want to make sure they're not lying to us. So we ask the same question a second time, get them to tell us the same story a second time, 
so we can confirm that that story is right. The fourth reason we might do that is, is for what we could call conviction. We want them to understand how serious the situation is or how bad their mistake was. And so we ask the same question multiple times to bring them to a place of great conviction over the matter, whatever it is. Uh, many times when my children were much younger, we would, I would do this. I would ask them that question a second or a third time just because I wanted them to feel the weight of the question again. I wanted them to feel the sting of the conversation again, right? The, the fifth reason why is confrontation. Sometimes we ask the same question multiple times to provoke a confrontation of sorts, not a physical confrontation, hopefully, not even a verbal confrontation, but, but, but confrontation in the sense that asking that same question a second, third, fourth, fifth time can be a method of confronting somebody with something that's difficult or uncomfortable. Maybe we're not quite ready to give our response yet, and we know that by asking them a question, we're able to put them in a situation, we're able to confront them with a matter that they then have to deal with, because we're not quite ready to deal with it yet. The sixth reason is what I call correction. We will at times ask the same question multiple times to correct a person or to lead a person to a place of correction or a place where they understand that they need some kind of correction in their life. We're, we're trying to teach them the lesson through the question. How many of you have ever done that, right? We're trying to teach them the lesson through the question that we're asking them over and over and over again. And then the seventh one, the final one I'll give you this morning is this. Sometimes we, we do this, we ask that same question over and over and over again because we're coaching them. It, it, it's a coaching method. Many times we ask that question a second, a third, or a fourth time. The same question, or essentially the same question, is a form of coaching because when they responded, they got the question wrong. And so what we're trying to say is, no, that's not the right answer. Try again, buddy. Give that another go. You, you didn't give me the answer you were supposed to. Again, we, we can think about this in, in light of us as adults with spouses and employees and employers, but I think it's funner and better to think about it in the context of parent-children relationships. Many times when we ask our child that same question a second or a third time, it's because they didn't get the answer right, and we want them to, again, think about it, consider it, deal with it, wrestle with it, be confronted with it, and we're saying, no, that's not the right answer. Don't give me that one again. Try again. They're pointing you, or we're pointing them, we're coaching them to a different conclusion. If you take some time later today or this week to consider the text we're going to read today, I think what you're going to see is Jesus does all seven of those things when he asks this question two times of the same group of people. He's asking this question of us today, I believe, as well. It, it, it's a question I believe Jesus is still asking and still wanting us to answer. And it's one of the simplest and scariest questions in all of eternity. This is one of the simplest and, and at the very same time, one of the scariest questions in all of the Bible. Here's the question Jesus asked. Who is it that you are seeking? I want to start in verse 1 of John chapter 18 because I want you to have the context of this question it says this, after Jesus had said these things, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. This is a familiar spot, not a secret place. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some officials and the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out 
and said to them, who is it that you are seeking? Verse five, Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. And when Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and they fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the words that he had said, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. At that, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. I'm not to drink, am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? I mentioned this question a moment ago, who is it that you're seeking? I mentioned that that's a serious question. It's a seriously scary question. On the surface, it it might not seem that scary, but when you really think about the question, it's, it's super scary. Now, we could come to this text, we could read this text, and we could do what 98% of other pastors and preachers and churches and people do when they come to this text. We could just talk about the ear getting chopped off because that's kind of fun and sexy to talk about, makes for some good stories and some good illustrations. We could come and we could just kind of bob around up here on the surface of the text and we could say things like this, you know, we need to seek Jesus, not the world. We need to seek Jesus and not fame. We need to seek Jesus, not fortune. We need to seek Jesus and not whatever else you want to put in the blank. And in saying such things, we would be absolutely right. In in saying such things, we would be theologically correct. But in saying such things, we would be taking this completely out of the context in which it was spoken and asked. In saying such things, we would likely all leave here very happy, very comfortable, We would leave here very satisfied with ourselves because it would be easy if we just bobbed around on the surface of this text, it would be easy for us to look at this and come to the conclusion that we're doing pretty good because after all, we're Jesus seekers, aren't we? Aren't we Jesus seekers, amen? I mean, you're here at church on a Sunday morning after all. I I therefore assume you're a Jesus seeker. You're a kingdom seeker. You guys are the cream of the crop. You are the willing. You are the faithful few who are doing your best to walk on the narrow road of life, to find that gate that few do. You could be in a ton of other places this hour, but you're here seeking Jesus because you're a Jesus seeker. And that's great, and I commend you for it, but that's the scary thing from our text. You see, those we just read about in our text were all seeking Jesus too. You see, here's the big idea for today. You can seek the right thing and still be wrong. That's the scary part. The people in our text are all seeking Jesus. And and, and so what that teaches us, what it shows us is, it is totally possible for you and I to seek the right thing and still be totally wrong. So we have to be careful that we're not just seeking the right thing, but that we, as Jesus seekers, are seeking Jesus rightly. Let's return to our text and see if I can clarify what I mean. I want you to notice this. This is point number one. These people that are seeking Jesus on this night, he asked the question, they're seeking the right person, but they're seeking him in the wrong place. Right person, wrong place. Judas and these other Jesus seekers on this night were looking for Jesus in the wrong place. They were looking for Jesus in his physical body. They were looking for him in a physical 
location. But what they were not doing is looking for Jesus in any kind of spiritual way. Their eyes were seeking Jesus. Their minds were seeking Jesus, but their spirit was not seeking Jesus. They were looking for the right person, but they were looking for Jesus in the wrong place. They thought they knew exactly where to find Jesus, and they did. They knew where to go look for him in his physical nature, in his physical body. Look at what it says in verse 1. After Jesus had said these things, they went out with the disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden. And he and his disciples went into it. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. Because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas took a company of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Judas knew where Jesus would be. He knew where to go seek him. Judas was seeking Jesus. The soldiers were seeking Jesus. But they were seeking him in the wrong place. They were seeking him in the familiar place. They were seeking him in the, new, in the place they knew he would physically be. You can still go to this place when we go to the Holy Land. We go to this garden. We, we pray there among those olive trees. You and I can still go there and seek Jesus through prayer to this very day. They knew they would find Jesus in this place because it was a place he went regularly with his disciples at this time in the evening. So on this night, as they are seeking, they went to the place where they knew he would be. And they're seeking and they're looking for the right person, but they're seeking Jesus in the wrong place. You see, where they should have been searching for Jesus was in their heart. They should have been searching their souls. They should have been searching their spirit. And so when Jesus asked them, who is it that you are seeking? He's he's essentially saying, why are you here? Who are you really looking for? What do you really, really need? What, What are you doing? Who is it that you're seeking But they missed the entire point of that question. I wonder how many times we miss it as well. I wonder how many of us are not that much different from these Jesus seekers who were seeking the right person just in the wrong place. I wonder how many times we have more in common with Judas than we want to admit. Let me give you some examples. We we very easily can fall into this. We can go and look for Jesus in all the familiar places, the comfortable places, the places we know he will be. We go and we look for him at church on Sunday morning. And this isn't bad. We we should go to church on Sunday morning. And, And we should know that Jesus is here. If you're ever a part of a church and Jesus isn't there, leave that church. We should be able to know that we're going to encounter the risen Lord in our worship services and at our churches, but we shouldn't just go and seek him there because we know he's there. Or maybe we go and we look for him in the Bible, and listen, I am a huge proponent of you reading your Bible. I want you to read your Bible every day, and one of the chief reasons for you to read it is you will encounter Jesus there. You will encounter the Spirit of God there. Again, it's not a bad place to look. It's not a wrong place to look. But if you're only going there because you know you're going to find Jesus, if you're not really going there to learn, if you're not really going there to be transformed and sanctified and changed, if you're not going there to allow Jesus to do something, if you're, you're just going there to be comfortable, or if you're just going there because you know he's there and you're checking that box to say you've been with Jesus that day, but you weren't changed by Jesus, what, what have you really done? You can go to that place out of habit and out of tradition and out of comfort and be seeking the right person, but be seeking in the wrong place. We could also mention seeking Jesus in our small groups. Again, great to be in small groups, great to be in Bible studies, great to be in accountability groups. I'm all for them. But if your only purpose in being there 
is to find Jesus in a familiar place, you've missed the point. We could talk about your favorite podcast that you listen to on the way to work or on the way home or maybe while you're at work that picks you up and motivates you and you go to it because you know Jesus is there and it's a, it's a familiar place, but it, you're only going there because it's familiar. We could talk about our favorite Christian radio station. We could talk about a number of other places that we go because when we go there, we know we're going to find him. But the bigger question really is, are we looking for Jesus not in the familiar places, not in the comfortable places, not in the places that don't challenge us or equip us, but are we looking for Jesus in the right places, in all places? Are we looking for Jesus in the hard places? Are, are we looking for Jesus in the dark places? Are we looking for Jesus in the uncomfortable places? Are we looking for Jesus in the inner places of our life? Are we looking for Jesus in the eyes of the homeless man or homeless woman that we pass by on the sidewalk? Are we looking for Jesus moving in the life of the orphan or the widow and using us as a part of it? Are we seeking Jesus in the moments and are we seeing Jesus in the moments of the temptations that we face in life? Are we seeking Jesus in the middle of our trials and our tragedies and our heartaches where it's uncomfortable and it's raw? Are, are we seeking Jesus when we're lonely? Are we seeking Jesus when we're afraid? Are we actively looking and running after Jesus when we're anxious? Listen, it's fine to look for Jesus in the garden because we all know he's there. But are we looking for him in the grave of despair and desperation as well? Judas and those other Jesus seekers on this night knew Jesus would be in the garden. But it would have served them so much better. It would have served them so much better that night and for all of eternity if they would have been searched inside of their souls rather than in the garden for Jesus. It would have been much more uncomfortable, it would have been much harder, but it would have been so much better. But the garden, it was a familiar place, an easy place, it was the most obvious place to find Jesus, and so it's where they went. In church, I'll tell you again, you can seek the right person and still be wrong. You can seek the right thing and still be wrong. You know what else we see here? You can, you can seek the right person with the wrong purpose. Who, who are you looking for? Who are you seeking? Why are you seeking Jesus? Why are you a Jesus seeker? Are you looking for an easy life? Are, are you looking for Jesus to solve all your problems? Are you looking to fit in? Are you just looking for a new group of friends trying to get out of an old crowd that maybe wasn't serving you so well and get into a crowd that you know will be better and you just want to kind of fit in? Are you just looking for a way to become a better person, a better version of you, so to speak? What's your motivation? Why are you seeking Jesus? Judas and these soldiers and these Pharisees and other religious leaders were Jesus seekers. They're looking for Jesus. And they're no doubt seeking the right person on this night, but they're seeking Jesus for the wrong purpose. Look at verse 4. Then Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it that you are seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. I am he. Jesus told them, Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. They were seeking Jesus to arrest him as a criminal, not to anoint him as a king. They were seeking Jesus to crucify him, not to crown him as Lord. They were seeking Jesus to capture him, not to confess him as Savior. They were seeking Jesus to silence him, not to serve him. They were seeking Jesus to mock him, not to magnify him. They were seeking Jesus to reject him, not to revere him. 
They are seeking Jesus to harm him, not to honor him. They are seeking Jesus to judge him, not to join him. They are seeking Jesus to trap him, not to trust him. They are seeking Jesus to condemn him to death, not to confess them as their Lord. They're seeking Jesus. They are Jesus seekers, seeking the right person, but seeking him for the wrong purpose. And this is why Jesus asked them multiple times, who is it that you're seeking? He wanted them to consider what they were doing and why they were doing it. They have the right person, but they have the wrong purpose at the exact same time. And this is why I think we all need to consider this question from Christ very carefully. Who is it that you're seeking? Why? Why are you a Jesus seeker? It's great to say you're a Jesus seeker, but are you seeking him for the right purpose or for the wrong purpose? Even as a Jesus seeker, we have to admit admit it is totally possible that we can seek the right person and still be wrong. Here's the third thing. You can seek the right person with the wrong power. Judas and those with him that night were seeking Jesus with the power of this world. They were seeking him, according to the text, with lanterns, torches, and swords. They were seeking them with the earthly knowledge that told him, told them they, that Jesus was going to be in the garden. All tools of this world... In a more precise sense, theologically speaking, they are seeking Jesus under the control of Satan and the darkness of the demonic kingdom. They're seeking the right person. They're Jesus seekers, but they're seeking him with the wrong power. And we see these two powers clash on this night. We see these two powers confront each other In our text, look at verse 5. Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, I am he, Jesus told them. Judas, who betrayed him, was also standing with them. And when Jesus told them, I am he, they stepped back and they fell to the ground. And then he asked them again, who is it you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they said, I told you, I am he, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This week I was studying this in the Greek and I noticed two things that I had never seen before and and two things that likely you can't even see unless you read this in the Greek. And both of these things were so simple and yet so astounding to me. The first was this, the statement that Jesus makes when when they respond to his question, who is it that you're seeking? And then they say Jesus of Nazareth, and then Jesus responds back, I am he. You see that in the text? I am he. But here's the thing. In the Greek, the word he is not there. It's not there at all. That is just put in our English translation to make it make better sense to us. I checked over a a dozen different English translations and they all say, I am he. It's not necessarily wrong, but there's a much more powerful meaning behind what Jesus actually said in the Greek. In the Greek, he said, ego am I. I am. Period. Period. I am. Now you might say, well, why does that matter? Why why does it matter that they left off the he? Because this is how God describes himself. Exodus chapter three, verse 14 is one example. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is how God describes himself as the great I am. And this isn't the only place that Jesus does this. We see it in other places, like John chapter 8, verse 58 and 59. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego am I. I am. Not I am he. He says, I am. He's declaring that he is the son of God. And that's why they picked up stones in verse 59 to throw at him. 
But Jesus, in declaring himself here in our text as I am, basically is not holding anything back. He's not hiding his identity or his purpose as the Son of God. When he says, who is it that you're seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, they reply, and Jesus says, I am. He ain't messing around, y'all. He says, I am. They would have understood he's saying he's God. Not he's just Jesus of Nazareth. You know what? We see further evidence of this clash in the second thing. This clash, there's a cosmic clash of cosmic powers between good and evil, light and darkness on this night. And it's found in this little bitty detail that's much more pronounced in the Greek, but even found in our text. It says in verse 6, John 18, 6, when Jesus told them, I am, they stepped back and they fell to the ground. At the sound of his voice and the declaration of his glory, they fall to the ground. One commentator on this passage said this, all Jesus had to do was speak his name, the name of God and his enemies were all rendered helpless. Y'all, there is no earthly power, there is no demonic power, there is no cosmic power, there is no governmental power, there is no power in all of creation that can stand against the spoken word of God. Jesus said, I am, and they were on the ground. There's no doubt in my mind at all of what Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You don't have enough strength. Your willpower is not going to save you on this day. Just as these men all helplessly fell to the ground, hardened Roman soldiers hard-hearted Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, even the betrayer himself, Judas, on the ground at two little words, I am. On this night, these people followed Judas seeking Jesus, seeking the right person in the wrong place, seeking the right person with the wrong purpose, seeking the right purpose, person with the wrong power. And so once again, I tell you, how you answer this question is important. It's why Jesus asked it of them multiple times. Who is it that you're seeking? Because you can seek the right thing and still be wrong. There's one more thing I want you to see in our text. Jump down to verse 10. This is where we see Peter make his big mistake. Here, once again, we see the right person, but this time we see the wrong protection. Peter's seeking the right thing, but he's doing it in the wrong way. Now, before we look at these verses, let me just say, I'm not judging Peter or Judas. I'm not judging Peter or these soldiers or these Pharisees or these Sadducees. I'm not saying I would have done any better than any of them. I'm not saying that, that I couldn't have been blinded myself from all that's going on here. But in Peter's case in particularly, I really do think Peter thought he's doing the right thing here. I really believe Peter is genuine and he's sincere in what he does. After all, he is the man that Matthew records in Matthew 26, 33, 35. Peter's the man that Matthew records as saying, even if everyone else falls away because of you, I will never fall away. And then Jesus says, truly, I tell you, tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. They were jacked up on energy drinks or something. They had their adrenaline pumping. Man, their testosterone was going. We're going to die with you, Jesus. We will never leave you. 
And I, I really believe they meant it. When Peter said those words, I, I believe in his heart of hearts, genuinely, sincerely, he meant it. And I bet those other disciples who all said the same thing, I bet they meant it too. So when Judas and the soldiers and the religious leaders with their torches and their lanterns and their swords all come and show up, these Jesus seekers seeking Jesus, when it all hits the fan, Peter pulls his sword out to protect Jesus because he has decided he is going to die with Jesus. He's going to protect Jesus. He will never deny Jesus. And look at it, verse 10. Then Simon Peter, who had the sword, drew it, struck the high priest's servant, cut off his right ear, and at that, Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. I'm, am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Peter is trying to do the right thing, but he's doing it in the wrong way. Matthew's account reads like this in Matthew 26, 50 through 54. Friend, Jesus asked him, why have you come? And then they came up and they took hold of Jesus and arrested him. And at that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and drew his sword and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. And then Jesus told him, put your sword back in its place because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. And then look at verse 53. I love this detail Matthew puts in. Jesus said, or do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus he tells Peter, I don't, I don't need your protection. My daddy's enough. I, I don't need your protection. At this very moment, I could have 12 legions of angels here protecting me. You know what? I think that's a good reminder, not just for Peter, but for all of us as well. Because I think sometimes we convince ourselves that it's our job to protect and defend Jesus. Listen, I'm not saying we as the men and women of God should not stand up. We should. I'm not saying we should not speak up. We should. I am not saying we should not live up to the calling God has on our lives as believers. We should. But I am saying sometimes we're seeking the right thing and we're still wrong. Because in our sincerest and genuine, most genuine and humble efforts, to protect God and to protect Jesus, we can hinder the work of God. In our humble and genuine efforts to protect, we can do more harm than good. Church, can I just remind us all, God doesn't need our protection. Jesus doesn't need your protection. We need his. And that's exactly what he's trying to teach and tell Peter on this night. I don't need you to protect me. You need me to protect you. It wouldn't have seemed that way to Peter, but that's exactly what's going on. And it's exactly why we need to consider the question and be able to answer the question, who is it that you're seeking? Church, if we are seeking the wrong things, we will end up in the wrong place. We all know that. We've all experienced that. We have all made that mistake in our life. We have all sought the wrong things and ended up in the wrong place. But it's also possible for us to seek the right things and still be wrong. My encouragement to you as we close is this. Don't just seek Jesus. Love Jesus. Don't just seek Jesus, trust Jesus. Don't just seek Jesus, know Jesus. Don't just seek Jesus, follow and obey Jesus. Don't just seek Jesus, repent in the name of Jesus of your sins. Don't just seek Jesus, confess the name of Jesus and be saved. 
Don't just seek Jesus, believe that God raised Jesus from the grave and be saved. If Judas and these soldiers and these religious leaders prove anything to us, it is this, you can seek Jesus and never be saved by Jesus. Don't just seek Christ. Be saved and transformed by Christ. And if that's going to happen, you have to repent, believe, and confess. You have to know Jesus, and you have to be able to answer that question, who is it that you are seeking? Let's pray. Who is it? Are you seeking the physical Jesus of Nazareth in a comfortable garden as these Jesus seekers were on this night? Are you going to get it wrong or are you seeking Jesus, the I am, the Son of God, the one who died on the cross for your sins, the one who made a way from earth to glory, the one who shed his blood so you could be forgiven, the one, the only name under heaven by which you can be saved, Jesus. Don't just seek the right person. Know the answer to the question, who is it that you're seeking? If you are here this day and you are seeking salvation, his name is Jesus. If you are seeking hope, his name is Jesus. If you are seeking love and mercy and grace, his name is Jesus. If you are seeking forgiveness and eternal life, his name is Jesus. Call on him. Be saved this day. We're not going to ask you to raise a hand, to walk an aisle. We're just going to ask you to pray to Jesus. If that's you, would you pray with me? Just say, Lord, it is me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. And so I ask this day by faith that you would save me. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would change me and make me new. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love and for your mercy. I thank you for dying for me, for saving me. Father, I thank you for the Jesus seekers here in the room. Lord, I thank you for those who seek you with genuine hearts. Father, I thank you for those who seek you sincerely and humbly. Father, not a one of us is perfect. Not a one of us is worthy. Not a one of us, Father, is able without you to do anything of worth or value or significance. Father, I thank you for accepting us when we seek you. I thank you for loving us and empowering us and gifting us and using us. Father, I pray you would use these kingdom seekers, these Jesus seekers, for your glory this week. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us here on YouTube or social media uh, for this message. We pray that God uses it to bless your life. If you don't mind, hit the subscribe, the follow, the like, the thumbs up button. 
Uh, leave an encouraging comment down below. It's so encouraging for us to hear how this is impacting you wherever you may be. And if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you with that as well. You can submit those by going to our website, cowboyfellowship.org. We pray that this blesses you. Thanks for being a part of our online family.